we're going to talk now about what's happening at the end of the month with regard to Brexit. It, it, even I find it hard to keep up with with some of the developments. I'm pretty sure, and we shall check in a moment with someone who will definitely know, I'm pretty sure that what is about to happen is the thing that Jacob Rees-Mogg, during one of his weird tenures in in a, a ministerial position, is the thing that Jacob Rees-Mogg decided not to do or insisted that we shouldn't do because it would be so damaging. It would be an act of self-harm. But I think we have to do it. Uh, now that we're no longer in the single market or the customs union, that's the thing about bogus beliefs in sovereignty. If you want to sell something into France or Germany or Portugal or Spain or anywhere else in the single market, you abide by their rules. And if you want to buy something from there, you abide by their rules as well. It's funny that, isn't it? Up to a point. So I think what we're about to see at the end of January is the stuff that Jacob Rees-Mogg described as being very, very bad for British business. But I could be wrong. Thankfully, Peter Foster is here, the public policy editor for the FT and author of What Went Wrong With Brexit, which is uh, um, absolutely splendid uh, and, and, and very easily digestible book. And, and Pete joins me now. So it, what is happening at the end of January and how big a deal is it? So you're, you're right, James. What we're doing is we're starting to phase in a border because for the last three years, all of our exporters, when they send stuff into the EU, have faced a full panoply of checks from the EU. Mm. But going the other way, EU exporters sending stuff to us, they've had a free pass. And that isn't actually really sustainable. Uh, it's going to cost business £500 million a year, but we can't really have no border, um, partly because it's just unfair. So we are starting to phase in the border. So from the 31st of January... Everyone sending any plant or animal linked product is going to need what's called an export health certificate. So that's a long certificate. You have to get stamped by a vet. And then from the end of April, there's going to be actual physical inspections on very low percentages of stuff coming in. And then from October, everything's going to have to have what's called a safety and security declaration. Now, all that stuff is complicated, but what you really need to know is that for EU exporters feeding into UK supply chains, they're going to start feeling some Brexit pain for the first time. And that, of course, for every EU exporter, there's a UK importer. Ah, trade goes both ways. That's exactly right. So if you make cakes and you're reliant on uh, liquid egg product from Poland, then you've got to make sure your supplier has a vet and has all the paperwork in order so that that liquid egg can come across. And there are certain sectors where there is lots of concern among the chilled food industry and the meat industry, particularly pig meat. We import 780,000 tons of pig meat, from a lot of it from Denmark, a lot of it from Germany. And there's just concern, for example, that there aren't enough vets in Germany to stamp all these certificates, because you actually have to really know the meat is safe and know where it's come from. It's not as easy as just rocking up and putting a stamp on. And the vets over there, their civil service, not private sector, are they going to work on the weekends? Are they going to show up in sufficient numbers? Are the exporters going to be bothered to get it straight? And I think that's where you're going to start to see pinch points in the supply chain because if i'm uh, the, the the polish liquid egg supplier or the danish bacon purveyor i don't have to do any of this if i'm selling it into paris or or, or frankfurt or or lisbon no indeed not 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 inside the single market and i think you know as we saw with the other way james you know when the eu brought the border in in 2021 a lot of small uk producers just gave up just wasn't worth the candle or or, or, or got bought out or opened up facilities in Europe and um, I, I, in order to keep supplying their European customers. But, of course, the smaller the outfit, the less likely that was to be an option in the first place. And, and businesses continue, continue to go under. If I ask you a silly question, do you promise not to laugh? Go on. All right. Well, why do we have to do it? Could, could we not just be buccaneering um, rule Britannia, Britannia waves the rules, and just say, well, you can, you can import, we don't have any rules whatsoever, you can import, I mean, I can see the downfalls and the potential pitfalls in that, you know, just things like botulism and salmonella and, and maggots and all that kind of thing, but, you know, Daniel Hannan and Jacob Rees-Mogg, they're not going to be affected by things like that because they'll still be buying the premium brands. Why can't we just let Europeans import whatever they want into this country with no checks or borders at all? Well, I think I'll tell you what the government answer to that question yeah. is. Well, first is a WTO point, right? You can't have checks on all the stuff coming from all around the rest of the world and then give one particular trade partner a free pass, right? That's, right. A, that's a level playing field point. The trouble is the WTO is broken. So truthfully, it took a long time to get in trouble with the WTO. Yeah. 
I, th- I think the other, but the other point is, it's a very unequal situation. We can't have a one-way street, effectively. And so, you know, there's two two fallouts from this. Well, on the upside, it might be that once the EU start to feel Brexit pain, they're more keen on getting around the table to work out technical and other yeah. solutions to fix it. The trouble with that is, remember, we're 53% of our trade is with Europe. You know, for them, it might be 8 9%. So the incentive is much reduced. On the other hand, they may just decide that dealing with the UK at the margin is just more trouble than it's worth. And so it actually, it just creates more barriers between UK, GB and EU. And that just we will end up reducing our trade with Europe. But I think... To say we have no border probably isn't sustainable, Mm. whatever Jacob Rees-Mogg said. And, I mean, so the best-case scenario is actually the the thing that Sadiq Khan is calling for, which is an opportunity, because at the moment it doesn't matter how loudly Labour politicians or any other politicians, SNP politicians, Liberal Democrat politicians, call for closer ties with the European Union. There's absolutely nothing beholden upon them to to, to provide them or even to sit down and talk about them. But if if they're... access to our markets gets harder then they might be interested in in reaching some sort of uh, arrangement and that is that so the best case scenario is the thing that um hillary ben and sadiq khan were attacked yesterday for suggesting by the daily mail well indeed so so imagine a world where there's a labor government it wants closer ties with europe it's not ideologically kind of committed to a zero-sum relationship in that scenario I mean, actually, a lot of this stuff goes away, James, because they want to do what's called a veterinary agreement. Yes. So we basically accept all EU rules on on plant and animal products, which is one of the big hold-ups at the border. Yeah. And then, actually, that makes the whole Northern Ireland thing more difficult. Remember that trade border in the Irish Sea between mm. GB and Northern Ireland? Well, a lot of that would go away as well. So we'll see. I mean, but that means a lot of rule-taking. You know, there are bits of the UK... And there are, of course, like. no longer rules in which we have any say whatsoever. Uh, finally, Peter Foster, the... Uh, promises prior to 2016 that we would retain tariff-free trade arrangements with the European Union and perhaps more crucially, frictionless trade with the European Union. They they have now, I mean, they are now uh, irrefutably dead in the water. There was never going to be frictionless trade. I know that and you know that, but people like Daniel (laughs) Hannan told us that there would be. I mean, they thought they were going to have their cake and eat it and ultimately we're outside the single market. And as you said at the top, you know, it's that's a single rule book, single referee, play by the rules, play by the referee. You can play. If you don't, you can't. And I, that's the end of it, you know. I'm going to tempt you off your patch now, and, and you'll probably tell me to wind my neck in, but because this is the conversation we've been having for the last hour. Is, is there anything in it politically for Keir Starmer at the moment to start calling for closer ties or to start calling to uh, just, just reading the political runes rather than the trade or economic ones can, can you see any benefit in it for him or is he is well, he wiser to keep sitting on his hands keep his power i can dry? see why he doesn't want to reopen this poisonous mm. argument that's poisoned our politics and you know been just so miserable for the last six or seven years if i was him mm. and i wanted to be the fastest growing economy in the g7 i would be more upfront about the fact that we have to fix our trading relations with europe and that is going to require you know, for the first time ever, well, for the first time in 40 years, a prime minister who's actually actively arguing the case for moving closer to Europe. And that isn't about, you know, sovereignty. We all trade sovereignty in all respects, but it's about saying, do we want to have a car industry? Do we want to be in the game for electric vehicle supply chains? Do we want high value manufacturers to be playing a proper part in European supply chains? Because if we don't, all of that is friction drag cost. And if you want to be the fastest growing economy in G7, and we all need growth to fund public services that are on their knees right now, that argument is going to have to be had. And it's not about people who vote for Brexit was stupid. It's not yeah. about sovereignty and masculation. You know, France is a perfectly sovereign country and it's a member of the EU single market. Of course it is. And so, you know, that's the argument I would make. I would say, you know, it's, a, it's about our prosperity. Before an election? Well, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Because, you know, <laughs> they're just worried the Tories are going to say they're selling out our yes, Brexit. Of course, the well, they already voters, are. Yes. The Red Wall voters, you know, are, are at risk of feeling cheated, etc. But I wouldn't just, I would just do it without using the B word. I'd say, yeah, you that's know, a good we point. Trade relations with our biggest market. <laughs> yeah, we should put it like that. It should never even have been controversial in the first place. But here we are. Pete's book, What Went Wrong with Brexit, is available now in all good bookshops. And of course, his work at the FT as public policy editor continues to set the very highest standards. And we're doing an event together, actually, at the Hay Festival this summer. I haven't got the date in front of me. Um, but I have got one day in front of me. I'm in Wolverhampton on, on February the 7th.